present. Okay. Um, I am. Um, This is where I get stuck. Oh, hear me or not, hopefully you can. I know I was just, I was thinking about it, I'm not sure if I will or not. I sent up, there was a Zoom link for people who can come, which I just started. Sorry, I'm wait, thinking if I need to wait a minute or not for poor people to come. I can always re-record the PowerPoint and send it to people if they want to. Though. It might be more coherent if I do it at my desk than what you're about to see. <laughs> oh, please, no. Yeah. Okay. Start if you want. I don't know if we're waiting for anyone else or not. Or oh, yeah. I can see down the corridor. I'm trying to see who's walking towards me. If I know if they spots him. Well, we booked in for an hour, and I won't take an hour to talk to you. You'll be. Are the lights okay? You can see it clear enough on the screen. It's not Fun. Good if you want to, if I can find where the um where the switches are. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. it's not fun. We've got plenty of time. Oh dear. Yeah, 
Cappuccino in hand. Um, so, thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. I really do appreciate you taking a bit of time out of your day to um, sit and listen to us talk. So, um, the brown bag seminars, are, I was told, is a space for people who might be pre-conference and put forward an idea and explore something that's a bit more. Um, how can I put it? Let's finish their ideas to people and get feedback from them, rather than you looking at the finished article of ideas. And in that kind of spirit. Um, I wanted to run through with you something that the university is working towards at the minute, um, which is making a digital health incubator uh, program. Um, so none of the ideas are completely concrete. The things on the slide are kind of hypothetical and proposed, and I'm looking for uh, feedback, criticism, anything you want to uh, say to me, or engagement, or you know anything at all. So don't take it all as completely written. Uh, my name is John. I, my official title is the Project Development Manager for the Digital Health Incubator. The university is basically making a trials incubator system for digital companies to come into the university in some form or in an arms length company and be able to evaluate the technology that they've got uh, more from the implementation side. Uh, it doesn't exist yet, which is why my title for my job has got development in it. Um, in short, I've got about nine months to pull together what this organization might look like, the services it deliver, who's involved, et cetera, et cetera, um, which is why the title all says towards a digital health ecosystem, because um, we're, we're moving towards it slowly. So that is uh, phone apps, wearables, any health related objects. You might have a website based program to help with either the kind of lifestyle medicine that people use for monitoring conditions or something a bit more technologically based on a registered class one medical product. The idea being that we'll be able to work with a primary care, and this will be a partly primary care oriented talk uh, test bed, if you like, and the university can bring in evaluative expertise, trial expertise, information, whatever it might be. And at the end of it, the company comes with some kind of rubber stamp guarantee that their product does or doesn't work, why it doesn't doesn't work, and they can say that we have interacted with a research organization to test proof our concept of what we've made. So we've got an hour today, but I'm not going to talk through all of the, the actual text. I'm kind of going to go around it, really. But um, mainly the, 
the back to this is the university has launched a center for health technologies, which I is partly related to. It's on the back of a lot of e-health and mobile health and kind of health and social care related digital work that's come out of the university. Um, the EPIC project for start, if you ever come across that, which is called e-health productivity innovation in Cornwall, the Alder Silly, uh, that looks, looks at robotics and e-health solutions. Um, in Cornwall specifically working with businesses there. So we're kind of building a track record of research in, in this area. Um, it's in line with a lot of other concurrent work. The um, NICE has actually funded a few rapid uh, evaluation programs, one in Birmingham, one at UCL. So groups of researchers coming to think together to think, how can we rapidly evaluate digital health solutions? Because some of the existing um, sort of RCT methods might be, uh, I don't want, and in no way am I saying RCTs are bad, but they're not necessarily the best fit for digital health solutions. You can find RCTs, people have done in this area, but they don't necessarily map to how you'd evaluate an app or a wearable or digital uh, website for health related purposes. Equally, um, we're kind of in the, the beginning stages of the guidance for this. There's only really one piece of framework evidence that NICE have produced in March this year, which is called the Evidence for Standards Framework for Digital Health Technologies, i.e. Um, there isn't a lot of regulatory space. We don't have any frameworks really yet to map against um, the use of technology for what a good piece of digital tech looks like from a health or implementation perspective. So we've got the kind of space that we're trying to feeling our way around and um, university wants to be involved in it and kind of contribute to that dialogue. Uh, I suppose in the, um, the more immediate way, uh, this talk was a way to engage people um, in that journey because we don't have any definitive ideas about what that will be yet, but it will be a dialogue between test beds and primary care networks perhaps, or and the university and the assets in it could be someone like Health Watch and patient advocacy groups, etc. So that, that's really what I wanted to explore with you today. Um, in long and short of it, I will tell you a bit about the background to why this might be important. Uh, what is the digital health incubator we're building? Um, the kind of pilot beta testing stage for this organization is called the Sandbox. So you might hear me call it Sandbox. Uh, what are the competing ideas in this space globally and nationally? Some of the issues with it, because it is uh, like anything proposed solution, there are um, issues with it. Um, a hypothetical structure of what this thing could look like, and then basically some time, some feedback, really. So if that's clear, hopefully, um, one of the questions you might want to ask yourself is like, why would you need something to evaluate digital health technology, uh, really? I mean, one of the arguments is that for a university's perspective, uh, funding models have changed. Um, there is a, perhaps you could say an increasing need for universities to generate um, external income outside of the statutory funding. I don't expect anyone thinks the government is going to be giving more money in the future to anyone maybe Maybe it might be if we're very lucky, but alternative routes that the university can take for generating funds are going to be important going forward, I think. Um, secondly, as well, from a kind of regional perspective, it's good for the area at large. Uh, we wouldn't be the first university and definitely not the last to think about making what you could call a regional innovation ecosystem. So some places will specialise at, say, Oxford might have a biotech hub around it to you know, a more local level. You can think about the um, Hot Rocks project that happened around Falmouth in the Tremo campus where they built in, they were drilling underground to get hot water and turn it into a geothermal plant and lots of engineering companies sprang out of the university's involvement in that type of product which is why there's quite a lot of engineering firms around the Falmouth area. So building a kind of um, a cluster of companies that might associate with particular expertise around the university is a tried and tested method and it's good for the local business community and the researchers at the university too to have these kind of hubs, clusters, regional ecosystems. And I think the university would like something around digital health in the southwest to that end. Um, as well, so because I'm talking about primary care, because that's what we're starting off with with our work. Uh, if you had a test bed, which involve, and I'll talk about it in a second, lots of GP practices, they will have to an extent preferential access to solutions in digital health, um, particularly in the southwest. Equally, there's a need for um, GP practices to become research ready and be receptive to new innovations and changes. Like a lot of the healthcare service, it is under pressure to think about new ways to deliver the services. I think regular interaction with some kind of test bed to think of how we can change quality, improve services might be a positive thing. Um, equally, things in the long, NHS long term plan, five year forward view, et cetera, do talk about the um, patient first access to digital services, the NHS 111 telephone line, et cetera. So in short, some of these solutions are at the policy stage going to be coming anyway. So 
um, it's probably good to have some kind of trial test bed mechanism to work with researchers to think about how we can implement these things because they, they will be happening, I think, from a government point of view. To jump more into the kind of policy and primary care bit, uh, patients do have, I think, what the long term plan called the Digital First Primary Care Access to Patients' Right to Digital First Solutions. So, uh, you as a patient by 2021 should have, let's say, want to book an appointment online, you want to get my prescription online, you're meant to be able to have access to those types of services. It's going to be an expectation uh, that patients can request from their GP. Um, in addition, I talked about the NHS 11 phone line, and again, it, it's going to be helpful, as I mentioned already, to have some kind of upskill, um, upskilling in the workforce who may be used to the ideas of changing, trialing, testing things within their organisation. And this this prototype that we've been working on is in Cornwall. Uh, the GP contract that's changed recently uh, as well might be something that's relevant to think about. The other point is. Um, like I said, a lot of these sort of health-related apps are lifestyle-based, well-being-based. The idea is to monitor your condition. In some ways, they're, they're designed to stop you getting into your GP surgery because you better self-manage your care, you're more active. Um, your what you call patient activation measure might be um, better for managing your own condition so you're not actually in the GP practice. So the GPs, to some extent, can focus on the people who have complex, multi-morbid cases who... Um, uh, you know, who require more time and resources. So to so an extent, you might want a way to validate what works from a therapeutic perspective because it actually could save the GP's time to focus on cases where they want to spend uh, more resources, etc. Um, okay. Equally, you know, but there are financial implications for doing that to the efficiency of practices themselves. So uh, there's other couple of points I'll just mention as well. So a trials organization, an evaluation organization might help with things like understanding NHS interoperability standards. So one of the, the existing problems is, you know, I don't have to tell you, our systems do not connect well together. And anyone that comes and signs the latest new thing that can access in your GP practice or through whatever means probably needs to understand the NHS, how things interact. So we're not just adding on more complex systems that don't talk to each other. One of the problems with integration of primary secondary care and bringing in social care that the direction we're meant to be going into through um, uh, uh, through the um, STP, the sustainability transfer plans for integrating care services that systems don't talk to each other. So a test bed might be able to provide some information to companies who don't quite understand those systems. Um, equally, this is based in Cornwall. So this trial work that we've done already is largely but exclusively Cornwall based. And uh, the NHS long term plan talks a lot about uh, inequalities of care and Cornwall is a very particular place. So if you want to understand um, how your new technology solution is different between a rural or an urban population, we can do that there. Equally, it, richer or poorer, it does have a de high deprivation level. So if you're interested in solving inequalities of care uh, for a particular group, we can look at those too versus older, younger. Um, from a Devon perspective, uh, there are bits of Devon that essentially demographically look like the UK in 10 years time. So from a test bed idea, if you implement something there with let's say GP practices maybe in the Tor Bay area about what that might look like you, and you understand that this is the direction of the our society is traveling towards anyway and um, so we, you can play with those ideas about health inequalities too that the NHS long term plan is interested in which is one more reason why you might want some kind of evaluative incubator scheme. So um, the work today has been called the sandbox. Um, it's really it came out of the GP practice network itself. So it's kind of bottom up solution in response to what GPs wanted to know by their facing new digital um, demands, I suppose, from their patients. Equally, uh, I'll, I'll more, more than anything, I will say that we're trying to provide a framework for a real world evaluation, uh, including patient groups. But this test bed is 59 GP practices with a patient population of about 550,000. Um, so in short, we have the test bed element and we have the university element with the evaluators in, and this is our test bed that we've been working with for different companies. So um, before I jump into, I don't think I'll go too long with this slide, just a long, just a quick visual reference to say that this began in um, 2008, we've been putting together case studies, companies have been coming to the sandbox to get different types of evaluations, whether it's usability, feedback, etc. And the, where we are here now but is we've done a few case studies, we've got a developed a framework and a model we're working on. By 2020, we're thinking of probably launching some kind of primary care, you know, if everything goes correct and 
10 months later, we think we want to primary care digital health incubator scheme, and then maybe thinking about how we can interact with the primary care networks that are emerging in the business. The long story short is, is we've got a trajectory and we're trying to upscale our pilot work with about five companies that we've uh, interacted with, something a bit bigger. And um, part of the point of talking to you today is to understand how we can do that and what the university would like to bring to uh, such a venture. So um, after talking to you a lot about what our idea is, you might wonder, well, has anyone else done this already, basically? So um, one of the things I did was try and map out all the other what you might call digital health incubators or accelerators where a business can come in, they get support for their new idea, it can be venture capital funding, it can be mentoring, it can be information about um, your intellectual property, et cetera, it could be office space. Um, how many are there of those types of things that we would be competing against? Well, the USA, well, it's 111 I found so far, but then there could be lots of buried data. Unsurprisingly, the USA has a lot of these, of which California and uh, New York, Massachusetts, so the East Coast makes up quite a lot. Show you some nice maps. Um, the UK actually also has quite a lot too, and that might just be because I was searching through repositories and databases of these things. Some of them might be hidden, and my ability to read Chinese or German to find these things may, may be hindered, so there may be more outside of that. Unsurprisingly, again, a uh, majority of these things in, are in London with a few peripheral cities around it. So this would be the kind of first attempt at a more regional primary care focused integrator to this level. Um, mixed. So I found specific digital health incubators and then I found schemes that had funded digital health um, companies who are willing to take on digital health companies. So it's a, it's a spread and there's, I will talk about it in a minute, there's lots of different things that in this there. There are um, people who provide office block space and some mentoring and some facilitation about their business idea to the ones that are just venture capital based and we've got the money and we'll help you on your business journey. So they, they vary a lot. Uh, so, um, some high intellectual pictures for you. Um, from 2019, that's what I found on a global basis. Each point is a digital health incubator or an incubator for a digital uh, based um, business that would be recruited to that scheme. The only difference from 2015 for those found some older data sets is that um, I need something to point with. China and the Far East essentially didn't have anything in 2015 and they've started to move into that market now. Um, Northwest Europe, basically, and the US is where it nearly all is, which may not be a massive surprise. If we come and look at um, the US specifically, again, the, um, the, the, the East Coast around um, Massachusetts, uh, New England, um, New York, such as quite a lot. You can't quite see the um, California markers, but there's quite a lot in California as well, and a bit in the middle. Canada has two. Uh, I don't know why there's only two in Canada, but that, that's it. Um, but US is a US dominated market. Northwest Europe, you see Germany largely. Um, there's some peripheral stuff, there's a bit in Israel, there's a couple in Greece, um, there's two in Ireland, but it's either kind of Germany or the UK and a couple in Scandinavia too. In um, no, not that I found, they're kind of one of the tricky things of mapping it. You get sort of affiliate programs where somebody starts a program in California and then they try and replicate bits of it in other countries. So you might get patchy bits in Gulf states, but not, not that I found on the internet. But again, this could be my inability to read Arabic databases rather than it not being there. I'll show you in a second. It's a, it's a, you'll be surprised. It's quite an interesting random mixture. Um, UK, London, 15, or I'm reading that rightly from here. London, Cambridge, not surprisingly, two in Liverpool, Sheffield, Leeds area, and one in Glasgow. So you can, the southwest is rather barren for all this, and mostly anywhere rural, to tell the truth, which is not a surprise because um, these things cluster around uh, assets if you want, in terms of like, being money, physical space, etc. So our idea would be what can we do in this space from a regional perspective? Um, and no, I haven't because how this is one of the contentious things how you include. Is it an incubator, not in the traditional sense, or an accelerator in the traditional sense, I would call it. But one of the difficulties, and I'm going to talk about RCTs and our things in a minute, is the semantics of all of this. Because someone said, we went to the Royal College of General Practitioners last week to try and get them to kind of put a badge on what we're doing, because they have an incubator kind of sanctioned spaces where GPs can come down and test their new piece of kit. And they said, we think this is a test bed, but then what's a test bed? There's no kind of defined lingo for a lot of this stuff. Uh, exactly how you classify ethic is something different. 
it's definitely not the venture capitalist model. It's not the office space model. It's something very new, really. I could put, maybe I should have, in the future, I'll hammer a couple in. But um, so, they have. Um, I guess because it's mainly network based. It's a, it's a different type of, I suppose what I wanted to put on the map is what I saw as competing assets. So the, the accelerator base has a lot, it's not in any way, it's good, but it's around, you know, meeting, engaging, and kind of bringing people to groups, together as groups of network. There's no primary data collection and an evaluation on it. So that's the kind of a different scale. You could have everything from a network where I'm exposed to different people in my group that say, I want to meet people who've got finance here, I want to meet other people might provide intellectual services is kind of a sliding scale for me but um what we're doing or trying to do further is database so we can collect and evaluate what people are doing so i haven't put that on because i suppose i was worried about the how far i want to go on it because every hsn has probably got something that might map into that space so it's a kind of sliding scale of, of what you can offer um which leads nicely onto the slide so thank you <laughs> um I'll go to the bit that says organizational model. So you can get people that do this affiliated with a hospital, affiliated with a university, a venture capital fund, um, affiliated office space who provide mentorship. Uh, I found cons large consulting bodies who are running things as well. Um, a tech company, so like Deutsche Telekom has its own digital accelerator program. Um, Bupa has its own digital accelerator program, but they vary a lot in what, what they offer. So maybe I should update my um, up my maps, or there can be a mixture between the two. Uh, hospital affiliate was interesting. The US has some private hospitals that will um, just attach a digital incubator scheme to work with the hospital as a test bed. The UK has um, guys in St. Thomas in London that has done something similar to drive digital health solutions into the NHS directly. So some people have figured these things out. If I jump to the top, some of these things are intercontinental. Uh, there's a few people that have started in California and then gone to China and say, different large Chinese cities and said, we're going to replicate what we've done in California in China to access Chinese markets and see if we can replicate what we've done. Sometimes it happens within Europe, so it's intercontinental. Some of the Nordic groups of trial um, and evaluating people will move down to the Baltic and try and see if you can do in Riga what you did in Stockholm. Um, sometimes it's national, sometimes it's regional. Looking at the third criteria, which is delivery, individual delivery model, sometimes it's disease specific. So you might get just cardiology. So sometimes I found um, incubators that don't have any interest in a large slew of different conditions. It's just one very specific thing. I found one for optometry, just eye based solutions for improving um, technology around, I don't know exactly what they did. There's online versions. So if you want to improve your business, but you don't want to go to London for this incubator scheme, there is entirely online digital incubator schemes as well. And people did it for very different reasons. So some of them were social innovators who wanted to work with community groups, which is more, uh, obviously, uh, Epic is um, through the university, but it is kind of a bottom-up community-focused approach. Um, some people were just interested in making a charity at the end of their incubation period. Some wanted to definitely make money. So it was for-profit and some were, like I said, are NHS only. So it was a funnel for innovation into the healthcare, the state healthcare service. So there is a lot of difference depending on it and exactly what you call an incubator or an accelerator, I think is still a bit murky to the same. Um, what there is not a lot of is collecting of data, testing and evaluation, however. Uh, the majority of it is uh, office space and things like that or access to finance. Righty. Um, so you can map out until you're, you know, months and months and what exists, but that doesn't mean that you could tell if someone really wants it or not, if there, there is businesses who want to come and do these things. So one of the problems with this is that um, when you look at the data of what businesses could be your market, but they say the university wants to track businesses to come and do this, a lot of the data sets are kind of patchy and a lot of these people might be small, it might be a hand, small businesses who are not registered with any kind of uh, something called companies house with the government body say we are a business or an enterprise finding these people and finding where they might be is, is trickier until you're actually in the networks itself um we are doing existing mapping in devon call about these types of businesses you might want to work with us because like i said epic and other e-health projects in the university have been doing this for a while and we're continuing those exercises to find who these people are where they are outside of devon and cornwall though it's, it's more tricky there are hidden evaluators so um very kindly brought to my attention by uh, Siobhan and other people that um, there are people 
an academic who might be in a primary care department who's going and doing these things and they're not on the radar at all they don't have a website they don't have a twitter account they are just contracting their services to do evaluations for companies um, but that's a bit different than having 59 gp practices and 550,000 accessible patients so some of the people we might be competing with actually don't exist in the space unless you meet them face to face um, and the idea being that there are lots of other people sort of in the southwest working in this area and we want to see how we can work with them and it not being competitive because we're not the only people with this particular idea really okay so there are risks to this as well so um for a start i've come to the idea that to do such a thing requires a certain amount of flexibility um, in the organization if a company comes to us and says we want um, some usability testing some economics and some proof of concept um, here's some money and everyone's absolutely stretched in the university what you do how do you deliver this um, so there are some problems thinking about staff recruitment and work uh, workload just like there is in primary care as well to tell the truth with you so how do you deliver this in a kind of agile quick performance um, expertise some of the things that we might want to do let's say particularly health economists um, are What's the expression? Rare as hen's teeth was my PhD supervisor in health economy. So finding those people in the first place can be difficult. We have thought about maybe as you can recruit online, you could have a health economist in Brisbane if you wanted to. They don't have to be in this country. So there are ways around it, but it's tricky about, let's say, you know, finding the expertise for particular skills can be difficult. But equally we thought, you know, as well, the university actually has a track record of students involved in the project as well. There are other people that can be brought into the evaluation. Um, process that the university can offer. We have a contracting uh, consultancy model, so the university has to negotiate contracts with private enterprises. Um, this can be time consuming depending on how what the private company wants and uh, can take can stall sometimes or can be very quick. So it, it is a bit tricky about the timelines because if you someone comes in and says we want a pilot trial or whatever it might be, and you tell them, well, I've got be four months to recruit people and sign the contract they they may disappear elsewhere um funding funding is a problem um not everyone in the nhr wants to touch anything like this maybe not unsurprisingly because of the the issue about two primary things businesses don't always know what their primary clinical outcome measures might be or what they want to do uh, they made something brilliant but they they can't distill it down to a particular offering Equally, uh, long-term follow-up. So these things are great in the short term, but how do you ensure you follow people up five, ten, you know, months, whatever, weeks afterwards? Um, but on that end, uh, we have undertaken some training for something called the NICE MedTech Early Technical Assessment Tool, which is basically how to sit down with the company and get them to still what their core offering is, because a lot of people may be doing something brilliant, but when you have to tell them to drill it down to one measurable outcome, it's more tricky. Um, equally, the one advantage we might have compared to getting funding for, let's say, um, a trial type run for a digital health solution is that with working with a set of 20, 59 GP practices, we kind of have a captured test bed of patients so that they're not recruited, retained, and then trying to engage them afterwards. We know where they are, that we have all their GP records, and you know, as long as all the data protects and the information sharing is okay, we have them in, in a more kind of um, siloed nature to follow up with hopefully and that's the idea but i'm not going to pretend to stand in front of you that the idea we're putting forward is not without some issues to overcome just as general practice has these things too however though one of the things we're also thinking about is what we can do from a trial perspective but digital health is difficult because it's hard to blind the participants or the assessors when they're using tech themselves it's more time consuming if you tell someone I need to, a year to secure funding, six months to secure funding, then it takes three years to run the whole trial, do the analysis, it could be a year, two years. The market's moved on. Um, so how do we find a solution that is robust, but at the same time meets the needs of the market and companies? It's still an answer that people are, well, it's not there yet. Um, talked about the funding related issue, uh, but it does need to be pragmatic as well. Having just from a clinical perspective, proving that you've got some kind of clinical efficacy is great, but what we're trying to do is a bit more pragmatic. Uh, it has to work in the real world. Um, in all honesty, if you come up with something that's clinically proven but is not implementable in the real world, then it's it won't stick. Um, a lot of the products are lifestyle medicine and not class one medical products. So, and again, how relevant some of the clinical areas are is not debatable, but some of them have already been tested at this stage, or they've been developed by clinicians. So it may not even be within our remit to think about this as a trials organization, but it's still embryonic. Um, 
it could run, I thought, maybe as being a bit that functions as a study within a trial, as an idea. Um, we're still playing with this space, really. So I made a slide um, with some ideas of what this offering could look like uh, with potential services. Um, it's got names of potential people that could be involved. No one has signed up to anything. It's all hypothetical. Um, it's just my thought process. So please don't be alarmed if you see your name on the slide. So no one's signed up. This is just out of my head. But ideally, hypothetically, we could have a mixture of services with big data. It could be the university providing evaluation, reporting, health of economic students. The test bed itself, Corona Health CIC, contains patients, practitioners, simulation. Equally, there could be a staff bank for recruiting people who can have a steering board and local other organisations. Exactly how the HSN feeds into all of this, I'm still not completely sure. Of, but we're just in the space of thinking about what we could do because from the policy work that uh, I showed you earlier with the long term plan and all the direction of travel, um, things are coming this way. And if the university can leverage its assets and its people and its expertise to do something useful, I think we've got something potentially good on our hands. So, in conclusion, what the strength well is unique is there isn't a lot of primary care focus, a lot of the other existing systems are not in that area. So, we kind of thrown somewhat of a hat over the top of it. We have established pilot work, there are about five. Um, organizations we work with already so we're building in procedures and ideas about how to deliver these things and we have a captured patient population of about 550,000. Some of the weaknesses are that the SMEs don't really know what they offer sometimes it's hard to distill their what their core value proposition is down. NHR and big funders are sometimes hesitant to fund these things because of the lack of long-term follow-up exactly the, the, the kind of vacant space around regulations data on the market size and, and need is really patchy like i said finding the companies and knowing what they want is equally difficult sometimes however there is a margin market this is coming um there is a space to try and be a bit of a leader in this if they can be there isn't really many other equivalent test beds that are in the size and shape of what we're doing that i can find and we do have this captive means to follow up the patients um, however, one of the threats is it's unproven technologies um, and they can be rolled out before they're adequately proven. I'm sure you may have seen stories about what's happening in London with Babylon and some of the scandals that have gone on with that and not everyone being particularly happy with it. Um, regulations that may come could hinder the market process and the whole thing could just collapse in upon itself because if the gold standard becomes you have to have a three year trial for every piece of new technology that not to prove that it's going to slow things down for better or for worse. Um, we could all end up competing with each other in a regional basis rather than working with each other. Uh, university could be overshadowed by people who are just more agile to get these things done. And lastly, I, I can tell you what a venture capital company wants um, in terms of if it's going to invest in somebody. And if there is no regulation and no gold standard and people don't get on this bandwagon, it could just be led by the criteria of BC Capital venture capital wants their paper published, they want this affiliation, that affiliation, and it could just be driven by market forces and not, not anything else. Um, so that's my kind of SWOT analysis of what we've proposed. I would welcome um, any particular views or feedback about the idea. Like I said, if the brown bag is a space to say, here's a thing, tell me what you think about it. Um, that's the work that's going to be going on for about another eight months, I think, until we come to some kind of conclusions about what, what we're doing going forward. That's it. Have you taken any queries, questions, criticisms? Uh, John, if, if I were a company mm -hmm. and I developed a piece of software, what, what am I getting in return? Um, I think mainly what they struggle with is access to patients and staff to test it in a real world scenario. So let's say you want, you've got a piece of software that um, helps you book appointments online for your GP so you don't have to ring them up, sit on the phone for half an hour or go in face to face. How do you know it actually works? You know, before the GPs or well, the clinical commission group commission it, would it be, they, what they can get is real world efficacy by saying, we have done some simulations with actual patients and GPs through this incubator that proves where we've ironed out these problems and we've got this feedback and we, you know, we have a tested product. Because until you start, you know, and you can't prove that it works until you've kind of simulated it in a real world scenario. So even if you've made it, you don't have access to those kind of things as just a software company, typically. 
what if the, the thing that you've developed is already up and running in your that's already practicing? Mm -hmm. Then the, the practice managers aren't going to say, oh yes, we'll test it for you, because that's going to confuse the patients then to say, oh, this is your normal system. Mm -hmm. Oh well, we've got this under the good testing. Oh, you mean like a competing system? Yeah. Um, well, we kind of, it, it has worked. So, for example, with the online um, appointment booking, it competes with the telephone system. And they're quite happy with it because the receptionists don't like spending forever on the telephone. It frees them up to do other stuff. There has to be a rationale, like, like you suggest, of why they would buy in to do these kind of things. Otherwise, the, the answer to your question is they, they do it because the money comes in from the company to pay the GPs and staff time. So what they get in exchange is money for the GP practice. AC? As we are always looking at the products, and in this competition, the government is very particular to this one. We can discuss the network that they use for the fresh from the law. Have a database of staff expertise in the first in terms of running systematic reviews of whether something works or not. I don't think that's definitely something to look at. It may already exist somewhere within the fabric of the university, but uh, I don't currently have anything. I, I, uh, I should say I'm on week six, I think, of starting this um, piece of work. So I haven't got to that bit, but yeah, it's, it's you need to know what you can draw from. It. You're absolutely right, and exactly who would want to be involved is a more long term question. Yeah. So we have a real repository of expertise. Having the expertise doesn't mean any capacity to deliver it. And you really wind up the company. They look at the register, they are just the person they need, and they go, sorry, I'll have it. So that's the case. Yeah. You know, the, the, the rumor mill from the SMEs will just discredit it. Yeah, the minute one of them gets a bad experience. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, on that. We were just thinking exactly that's fine. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I'm on board. It. That's why I thought about maybe what would be useful is having kind of an online repository of people you can draw from who are not even necessarily physically here. But if everyone's stretched, there might be someone outside the university or another contractor. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's almost obvious. Anonymise the expertise. You want to say, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but not yeah. who. Yeah, try to find that. I've been, mm -hmm. I've been chatting to him about it, but again, it, it, in, in the irony of what we're just talking about, they're all equally busy and sitting down and getting their time to ask them about hypothetical stuff is it's tricky too. Um, well, I'm telling yeah. you they're with their extra new so yeah. if you're not getting the service, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to complain about that. <laughs> <laughs> Take it as a complaint, but if you're not getting what you need. Well, it, it does hinder on nothing because the, part of the whole rationale is the university has lots of skilled people that, that we can use for this thing. And then 
if it turns out that it's kind of not that they're not skilled, but getting to the delivery point, that's that's an issue, you know. And um, there is also the thing in the back of my mind that the reason that we haven't found anything else like this is because it's really difficult to pull off, you know. <laughs> so, go ahead. So we've done some before that based on um, service evaluation models for people. Um, normally a lot of the kind of internal payments and the NHS stuff are handled by the GP practice partner we've been working with before. Um, because it's not to date, we haven't been doing what would be categorized as research by the NHR and NHS's own definitions. It's service evaluation or improvement. However, if we want to... No, I think if it expands, it's going to have to include all that kind of stuff. That's the time frame which is actually proposing as we all do those processes. Yeah, yeah. Agile for development of new technology? Um, good question. I don't think so. I think you'd have to go through the standard um, health research authority process like everyone else if you wanted to do it. I very much doubt there's a way around it. Um, but however, that'd be the same for anyone else who wanted to offer similar services, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It is a change. One of the positives about having a university, I've thought about that issue, is saying we do have a track record of getting funding for projects and things. But again, getting the funding is time consuming. So I haven't found a way out of it, yes, but the scale is an issue for these things. They can accommodate all the processes that come with it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a head of um, what Exactly what it is you're trying to accomplish, but the exact basis of it, what you're trying to do, 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 what you're trying
that's one of the badges. It's not just been done by a consultant, not like demigrant consultants, but if you say it's done by, you know, someone in Peninsula Medical School or it's done in University of Plymouth, that's one of the perceived um, sources of proof that what you've got is useful, valid. Yeah, that's another question. So exactly what the organisation is going to be in the uni, arms length company, community ingest company, how it's going to be constituted still being weighed up. I know you're restricted to Devon and Cornwall because well, it's limited because you've got national expertise in the next generation. Mm -hmm. You want to offer that to the country rather than just we've started with Cornwall because that's where the kind of beta testing pilot work is done. But I think the idea is like you said, it's not is that because of the RDF funding drivers of the um, oh, what is the the test bed is a partner on our the RDF project, so that's where we started from and the bottom up, and it doesn't have to end there. It's just that that's where our oh, patient yeah. practice test bed is going from. Be right. Yeah, ideally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the use of this. I protect the restriction of the population. Yeah. I don't get the restriction of the SME community. No, no there shouldn't be a there's no such thing to be different. So we, we have them work with the so the, the, the like sense the mapping exercise is protected the core. No, 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 no. This is a company that you would want to give to a company national company. So exactly. So some of the people that come to us just want to understand what the NHS is as a system um, because they've done well elsewhere and they want to come to the UK. So that's one of the other kind of categories of people. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's within the scope of, of what we've been doing. That's more for the GP practices. But I mean, yeah, go on, I see, jump in your key there. No, I think, well, I've been working on that to try and find examples. So far, we haven't moved to that kind of larger step yet, but it is an area that we are thinking could be useful again, because the what I'm trying to do is to think of how we can scale up what we've done, and that's something that's been on my mind. I've been sitting down with the, some of the IP people at the university, I'm sitting down with some of the legal staff in the next coming week to talk about those particular things, because uh, to date we haven't counted it, but it will again. Um, that's the point made earlier, as you scale up, these things come. And yeah, it's going to have to be. And one of the nice things that we'll be able to offer is, like I said, expertise to interact with all those different databases and what the potential that could bring for types of analysis that can be done for the businesses that come through. All the legal stuff will have to go with it. Um, I've been trying to recall all the GDPR training I did a while back. Um, 
large practices, conglomerations across the Mm. I'm not working with those hubs. Those you know, off the top of my head, I'm not sure what the biggest practices are in Cornwall numbers. I mean, the, the idea is hopefully start in Cornwall and build out with them the stuff that Beacon's done in Plymouth have been really good and they have this kind of digital champion scheme and everything. They've got some exciting stuff that would be useful to go into Devon, but I don't know what the biggest off of my head practice group in Cornwall is. Yes, some of them We were thinking about disease prevalence for a lot of it, depending which companies come to us, you know, so if there's a particular area where diabetes is high or whatever the solution might be, we were working on that kind of basis at the minute. But there's a debate about, you know, how how generalizable and scale based some of this needs to be. Are we really even aiming for some of that or is it just can we tell the companies this is an implementable good system that if you go to other areas of the country that have a primary care stuff it will integrate i don't know if it's even it's still it's still debatable in my head if we should be appealing to the kind of those kind of ideas and what that may be something even separate that we're going for i've been reading um actually sitting up in front of me some guidance about um guidance for apps and wearable developers and it's listed all types of different types various trial methods etc if you want to step to edge or whatever some of them that are called trials have got 36 people in them you know they're, they're not that advanced in terms of numbers or duration and i can't decide yet if we want to be going for that kind of powered work or not to tell the truth yet the risk of trying to do too much stuff at once and whether it makes me think there's lots of signposting like I said that could go on that if that's something that's needed it could be pushed in their direction to work. Yeah. And the other thing was that along with the changing the paradigm of the a similar thing has happened in the past. The cascading model of the monolithic IT corporations IBM to the agile model, mm -hmm. which now allows very small companies SMEs, to get into the space yeah. of uh, development. And with that comes also different evaluation the evaluation model for the system, which is the Apple side yeah. that way, as you said, RCPs are not the agile model fail early, 
of the table often and yes, everything as often becomes the paradigm rather than try to be try to get it right in the first time through a long process. No, I agree. It's, it's a good point. But yeah, maybe it's that we try to tie in what we're doing to the long term policy mm -hmm. objectives because I think that's what's going to have to happen from a governmental perspective at least. Any other questions, comments? Nope. If, if there's anything else you want to say, email, criticisms, I don't mind. There'd be, I'm looking for holes in this as well, because if it's going to work, you have to know where the problems are. Um, please email me. I, I didn't think I neglected to mention, I also work two days a week in M10 in the clock, so I'm physically here as well. <coughs> if you want to come and talk to me about any of this, and I think actually, Bang on schedule. <laughs> Thank you for your time and your patience and your feedback. Thank you.